This week on Q&A, author and Hoover Institution Senior Fellow Thomas Sowell. He recently ended his syndicated column, which he had for 25 years, and he talks about his life and career and his love of photography. Dr. Thomas Sowell, you wrote this at the end of 2016, age 86 is well past the usual retirement age. So the question is not why I am quitting, but why I kept at it so long. Why did you? Why did I keep at it so long? Yes, sir. I, there were a lot of things happening that I, I thought ought to be uh, explained in a different way from they're explained uh, in, my, in most of the media. And uh, I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed hearing back from people. I was sorry that I never had a chance to reply to them all, which would have taken up every, all the time I have. I have your last column and there. I'm going to just ask you why you put this in, in the column uh, and you can expand on it if you would like. My own family did not have electricity or a hot running water in my early childhood, which was not unusual for blacks in the South in those days. What, what do you remember about those days and where was it in the South? Oh, well, I remember a lot because uh, I, I didn't, didn't leave the South until I was almost nine years old. And so I spent a fair amount of time down there. Uh, and most of those places, there was no uh, uh, hot, running, hot running water. We had cold water, which, which many other blacks in those days did not have, by the way. Uh, but it, it, so, it sort of uh, says where I came from. You moved to Harlem. Uh, what was that like and who did you live with in Harlem? Oh, I lived with the same family that had uh, raised me uh, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, uh, some members had gone up ahead and had been in New York for a year or so, I think, uh, before we got there. And uh, fortunately for me, they ran into a, a, a boy named Eddie, who was quite unusual uh, in, in the, for those days. He, was highly, he came from a highly educated family. He was obviously a very cultured uh, fellow. Uh, and so before I ever arrived in New York, they had decided that this was someone I needed to meet because he could tell me things that they themselves did not have the education to tell me and that this could help me in life. Now, at the time, I myself was not by any means looking ahead that way, but, th but, th but thank heavens, other, uh, others were. Where is Eddie today and, w and what did he do in his life? Well, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's ironic. Uh, last year, when I, uh, on my birthday, I received a card from him. Uh, he's, a, he's a year older than I am. Uh, he, w he went on to become the dean of one of the colleges, uh, and uh, uh, he's now retired, so living in a very nice uh, area. Uh, so uh, uh, it was it was quite a pleasant surprise. But my life really could have been very different had had I not. Uh, been introduced to him. And I would never have been introduced to him except that members of my family who were older uh, saw immediately that this was someone who could be helpful to me. Uh, he and I never lived within a quarter mile of each other, and he was a year older, so I would never have been in the same class with him in school. But uh, he was able to tell me things that I didn't know. For example, uh, he took me to a public library for the first time in my life and at the time, I had no idea what a public library was and was really f very dubious when I saw all those books and realized I didn't have enough money to buy one of them. Uh, but he patiently explained it all to me uh, and uh, persuaded me somewhat reluctantly to take out a library card and, uh, and, and, and borrow a couple of books. And that was enormously important because it meant that I began to acquire the habit of reading on my own. Uh, you know, years before I ever would have acquired it uh, in the normal course of events. What kind of books were you interested in in those early days? Oh, heavens, I remember reading the oh, ch children's books, you know, Dr. Doolittle, uh, Alice in Wonderland, stuff like that. But the main thing was that I read and read and, and eventually simply got the habit of reading. Uh, other kids from the same neighborhood in which I grew up would, you know, odds were against their ever meeting someone like Eddie. It was as they were for me, except that others saw the significance of introducing us. How long did you live in Harlem? Oh, I, until 19, uh, I was uh, 20, I was 20 years old the, fir the first time I uh, moved, moved out of Harlem. Uh, and then I came back for a couple of years. 
Uh, so I, I grew up there from the time, from the age of uh, just before I was nine years old. So uh, besides Eddie, what impact did Harlem and your family experience have on you other than, um, you know, the library? Oh, I think a tremendous uh, uh, effect. I, I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, for example, I, when I was much older and uh, had, a, had a son of my own, like most first-time first, par first parents, I wanted to know when he's supposed to do various things. And so I uh, asked one of the surviving members of the family, how old was I when I first began to walk? And she said, oh, Tommy, nobody knows when you could walk. Somebody was always carrying you. And I was raised, you know, as an only child in a family of four adults. So, you know, whenever I got to be too much for one of them, he, could all, he or she could always hand, it all, hand me off to somebody else. Uh, and I remember one episode in particular that was recounted many times in later years that uh, Bertie, a member of the family, t t took me to a movie. And uh, we, everything went fine. Uh, it was on a different part of town. And it was only when we got back and I saw the house where, where we lived, I picked up some rocks and started throwing them at Bertie. I must have been four years old at the most. Uh, and in later years, she would tell, tell that story and just laugh that, you know, I was a little angel until, until I got back there. And I th I've, in, la in much later years, I've thought, you know, you, you can take that attitude when there's one child and four adults. If it's the other way around, one mother and four children, it wouldn't have been nearly as funny. You know, you, we've talked before and you, you um always mention that you like to think things through before you either write a book or you write a column and you're not in any hurry to have those published. How about this final column? How long did you think that through and what kind of a message did you want to leave at the end? Well, I did two final ones, I, but uh, I don't think I took any longer than with the, than with the others. I mean, these were, th these were thoughts I'd had. I had thoughts of, uh, of uh, uh, not renewing my contract in some previous years. Uh, but uh, my wife always ta told me that, you know, you, you, the, you, at the very least you can uh, blow off steam uh, when, when things happen in the world that you don't, that you don't like. But I, this particular time, uh, I was off taking pictures in Yosemite with some uh, photographic buddies of mine for four days. Uh, and in all that time, I never watched a television news program. We never s read a newspaper. And I thought, this is the way to live. And the only way to live this way is to stop writing the column so that I don't have to be up, up to date on all the news. And that's the biggest benefit, that when I'm uh, watching a television program and, uh, the, and some silliness in politics comes on the air, I can simply s switch to the tennis channel or, the, or, the, or turn the classic movies or just uh, do, turn the thing off. Uh, because I feel no obligation now to keep track of things like that. And, you, they, and those kind of things certainly don't do my blood pressure any good. You're, I know, sitting on the Stanford campus in Palo Alto, do you um, remember when you had your first solid c political thought or idea? Oh, yes, heavens. I was 10 years old, and, uh, and it wasn't really my idea. It's what I had heard. And the... Uh, I had heard that, uh, uh, that Wilkie was for the rich and uh, FDR was for the poor. And so my first political activism was going around tearing down Wilkie posters in Harlem. Fortunately, there weren't that many Wilkie posters in Harlem. And so I didn't waste a great deal of time on that. Were you, did you consider yourself a Democrat? I don't know if, well, at that time I was a long way from voting age. Uh, but uh, for most of my, I was a registered Democrat as late as 1970, as the spring of 1972, uh, for the last time. And since then, I've never been a registered uh, member of any party. Uh, that particular year, I was so disgusted with both candidates that I didn't vote at all. Uh, and neither of those candidates seemed to be as bad in, in retrospect as the two candidates we had la last year. Let, let me go back to the column and ask you about this paragraph. Years of lying presidents. You're talking about uh, could any president do anything uh, like that today, meaning it was John F. Kennedy you'd been writing about and, and the Soviet Union and the trust that people had in the president then. But you say then years of lying, Democrat 
Lyndon Johnson and Republican Richard Nixon especially destroyed not only their own credibility, but the credibility which the office itself once conferred. The loss of that credibility was a loss to the country, not just to the people holding that office in later years. Why did you consider both Johnson and Nixon presidencies as lying presidencies? Well, Nixon is the easiest one. I mean, he, he, he lied, obviously, about uh, Watergate. Uh, but, I, but in retrospect, I think uh, the, the fact that Nixon was so obviously lying, I regard as almost a virtue. That is, when you saw him on television uh, saying things that were turned out to prove to be false, you could see him sweating and so forth. I mean, you, you, it didn't take any great uh, insight to know that he was lying even before the evidence came out. Uh, with Lyndon Johnson, my gosh, there were so many things he said. Uh, he got us into this uh, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin re resolution later on, later on, turned out to have been fed by something that was uh, co completely uh, overblown in order to give him power to go to war. But at the crucial time in that war, after the Tet Offensive of 1968, uh, the media all said that uh, this, this uprising of communist guerrillas in uh, South Vietnam will show that our policies had failed, that the, that the communists had won. It so happens that later evidence, including statements by communist leaders themselves after they had conquered Vietnam, was that the American troops had actually wiped out the Viet Cong guerrillas inside Vietnam, uh, and, and that they were never a serious force thereafter. But what came through the media was that the Viet, the Viet Cong guerrillas had, had succeeded, that they had inflicted a terrible uh, a loss on Americans, and that the war was unwinnable. Now, if the public thinks the war is unwinnable, that will in fact make it unwinnable. And Lyndon Johnson came on the air, told the truth, perhaps a, a rare thing for him, and yet he was not believed. And all those in the media who were putting forth what turned out to be completely false stories were believed, and therefore all the 50,000 Americans who, who lost their lives in Vietnam, winning victory after victory, uh, all of that went down the tubes because the president didn't have credibility when he needed it. What's been the impact of the Vietnam War and the Watergate years on this country? Oh, no, no question, a, a, a great cynicism about uh, the public. If I may go back to uh, John F. Kennedy in, in 1962, at the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, I was never a big fan of uh, uh, President Kennedy, and he, he won very narrowly in 1960. But when he came on the air and told us that the Russians were going to put nuclear missiles 90 miles from the United States, and that he was taking us to the brink of nuclear war to stop them, I, I thought, you know, he's president. I mean, he's got to do what he's got to do. And uh, it was a very, very tense time. Uh, I was teaching at the time, and I remember when I was giving out the assignment to the students in class, I said, you know, the assignment for next week, and I had to bite my tongue to keep from saying, if there is a next week. I know. But that was, there was that kind of confidence. I don't recall anybody raising any fuss with this man for taking this step that really could have been the death of uh, millions. Uh, as he well knew. Uh, yeah. Today, I don't think any president of the United States uh, in the last 30, 40 years could go on the air and do that and have the public behind him. And that's not, not a problem for him. That's a problem for the country. If you have a president, he has to have the public support, not for his sake, but for the public's sake. Do you remember how you felt about <clears throat> Watergate in the middle of it all? Yes. Someone was trying to get me to accept a presidential appointment in the Nixon administration, and they asked me to send, me, send them my uh, 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 Vita. And I said, you know, I have to tell you, in, in order to prevent you from being embarrassed, that I'm very disturbed about what's coming out about Watergate. And at some point, I may find it necessary to criticize the President of the United States. And the guy at the White House said to me, Tom, if we, if we uh, uh, let that stop us, we never will get these jobs filled. S Phil, s send us your resume. And what'd you do? No, I decided I didn't want the job anyway. You know, <clears throat> while you're on that, I've, we've got some video of you back in our talk in uh, 2005 
uh, talking about an, a, an offer you had <clears throat> in the Ford administration. And as people listen to this, they have to keep in mind when you're telling this story that there was a Democratic Senate at that time. Let's listen to this and uh, you'll see uh, what you said back in, in 2005. Which president offered you the Federal Trade Commissioner's job? Uh, president Ford. What were the circumstances? Uh, they had a vacancy. It was, it was 1976, and they offered it to me. And I agreed to take it on condition that uh, if there's any opposition that uh, arises, they let me know I'll withdraw because I don't have time to play Washington games. And uh, I kept calling there and asking and the guy at the White House who's handling this, uh, is there any, I don't hear anything, what's going on? And he said, oh, no, no, it's just taking time. And eventually I was in Washington, so I went up to the Hill and talked to the, uh, the uh, staffer of this committee that handled this. And uh, he said, uh, we've gone over your record with a fine-tooth comb. We can find nothing to object to. And therefore, we're just not going to hold hearings. Because this is an election year, we expect our guy is going to be elected, and he'll appoint his own man. What burned me was that he said, and I, and I said, did you tell the White House this? He said, we told the White House this months ago. And um, would you have taken that job had they <clears throat> cleared you in the uh, Senate? Uh, you mean after no, after learning this? Yeah, well, no, I mean, if it had, the process had moved faster, had you agreed to go to the Federal Trade Commission? Uh, yes, I, 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 w I would have, uh, reluctantly, but uh, some, uh, in fact, the first time it was offered to me, I said no, but they came back again, and in the meantime, uh, someone whom I knew said, uh, Tom, you got, you're always criticizing the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, here is your chance to be one of the commissioners, and I thought, you know, I, I really should then, so I would have taken it, but it was not something I, lo I look forward to. Uh, uh, it meant moving. Uh, it, did, it, didn't, it did not mean any increase in pay, but, but it did mean an increase in uh, cost of living and so on. So, I mean, there were many downsides for me personally. But I thought that really as a matter of uh, living up to what I've been saying, I ought to go and try it. Now, your first job in government, though, was uh, considerably earlier than that. And what was it? Oh, I was a GS2 clerk in the General Accounting Office back in 1950. And that was a big step up for me at the time. That, that means that you were a GS2. They start at GS1 and go up to GS18. I, I don't know if they still do 18, but they do the senior executive service. Why had you gone in the government, and what impact did those uh, years have on your thinking today? Well, you mean the years before or the year after, years well, after? Afterwards, yeah, after you had had the experience of working in the government. It, it was not habit-forming. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of double dealing and, and, and stuff going on, uh, but uh, by that by the time this this is before I w was uh, drafted and went into the Marine Corps. Uh, but after I came out, I came went went back eventually to that job. Uh, but now I, I realized I had the GI Bill to back me up, and that I would now uh, try to go to college. And so I, I never regarded that as a career thing. Uh, I, I just, uh, it was something I, I would do. And that gave me a great deal of freedom because for one thing, there's one example of the freedom. Uh, back in those days, the General Accounting Office had a, a large unit that was essentially all black. And it was presided over a, a white woman from Georgia. Uh, and uh, they had different rules that when in other units, if you were late, you, you signed a T for tardy. But in uh, the unit that I was in, uh, if you were late, they, they docked you a, uh, an hour's annual leave, and you, had, you signed for it. Uh, since I was planning to, to leave when, I got, uh, when the time was right, and I was going to turn in my annual leave for money, I was not about to sign for that. For that. And I told them, quite frankly, that not only was I not going to sign, that if they took the leave without my signing, I would take the case right up to the Civil Service Commission. They immediately realized that they, they, they knew they were wrong to begin with. But they realized if I did that, you know, all hell would break loose. Uh, and so, uh, in one of those wonderful political compromises, they would let me sign a T for tardy, and everybody else had to sign for, a, for an hour's annual leave. And that deprived me of any standing to bring any case. I told the others, but they wouldn't believe me. Many of them felt I must have some secret in, I must know somebody or something. But uh, that, that was the way it was. The, the other thing was, the other people were career civil servants. 
And so they, they, they knew not to make waves. I really didn't care because I wasn't planning to be there that long. Did you ever ask anybody then why in the world they would have two separate, uh, you know, ideas about what, if somebody was late, why they would do one with the whites, one with the blacks? No, because I mean, it's, it, 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 I, I think if you put a, 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 a white woman from Georgia in the 1950s in charge of a black unit, that's what you expect to happen. In a, uh, talking about your last words that you wrote, at least in your columns uh, for, uh, was it a Creative Services? Creative? Uh, Creative a Creators Syndicate. Syndicate, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, the first column I ever wrote 39 years ago, and this is, you wrote at the end of 2016, was titled The Prophets of Doom. This was long before Al Gore made millions of dollars promoting global warming hysteria. Back in 1970, the preventing hysteria was the threat of a new ice age promoted by some of the same environmentalists who are promoting global warming hysteria today. Do, do you, I tried to find that column on the internet it's not there that I could find is it available for any of us to read yes it was published in the old Washington Star which as you know uh, went out of business some years ago uh, hopefully not as a result of my columns but uh, there's a book called pink and brown people which is the first collection of my columns that was published by the Hoover Institution back in uh, early 1980s and, it, and it's it's in there well, whether, whether that book is still in print, I, do, I don't know. But, did, did you go uh, it, when you wrote there. your last column? Did you go back and read it? Your... No, I did not. Well, uh, but I remembered it because it was my first column, and I had no thought when I wrote it that I would be writing regularly. Uh, the Washington Star had a feature where uh, ordinary readers could write in and send in a column, and I sent that. That was the first time I ever tried it, and and they published it as I wrote it, and so that was the beginning. Your undergraduate degree was from what school? Harvard. But you started at Howard and then went to Harvard. That's right. Your master's degree was from Columbia? Yes. And then your PhD at Chicago. Um, what was your dissertation about? Oh, it was uh, called Say's Law and Historical Analysis. And in fact, I wrote a, a very expanded version of that dissertation uh, as a book uh, published by Princeton University Press. I counted, I, I got on Amazon and counted the number of, and just very quickly counted the number of opportunities to buy something with your name on it. And I think I stopped at 57, but uh, I know those are all uh, kinds of things, including essays. But how many actual books have you completed since you started writing them? Oh my goodness! You know, I I have I've been asked that question. I've never actually counted them, uh, partly because it depends on what you mean. There are books that are original books. There are books that are collections of previous writings, and so on. And there are monographs and so forth. But I've never really tried to keep track. But it's a, it's a few dozen. At this point, um, uh, which one of the, all those books sell the most? Oh heavens! Basic economics not only sells the most in English, it's been translated into. Uh, seven or eight languages. What would you say would be the most important thing, and I know this is a, a simple question, most important thing or things that people who read that book will learn? Oh my gosh, that is tough. But I guess they, they'll learn what economics is all about, which, which is more, more than just the sum of, uh, of, the, of the topics. And in the first, first uh, chapter, I point out that economics really, I, I use, elaborate on a, a definition from the London School of Economics, that economics is the study of scarce resources which have alternative uses. In other words, uh, there was no economics in the Garden of Eden because everything was available in unlimited, unlimited quantities. But I think in thinking generally, whether in economics or otherwise, too many people do not begin by saying, what are the inherent constraints of the situation we're talking about? And, and they act as if, you know, they're God on, 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 on the first day of creation and can follow whatever policy seems to them best. You know, but by the time, when each of us enters a world that is already completely elaborated and complex before we ever got here, and so you make your decisions within that context, 
And if you don't think of it that way, uh, you, you can have all sorts of utopian notions. Uh, to give one obvious example, I, I, I hear I, from time to time people complain, you know, that George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, condoned, condoned slavery. Slavery was there for centuries before George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were ever born. The, uh, and neither of them thought that the office of the presidency had any powers to do anything about it. Uh, Lincoln was able to do something about it because he did so not simply as president, but as the commander in chief in a war. And what he did applied only to people who were in rebellion against the United States. But there was no basis otherwise. And so they, if, if, if you can't think in terms of what were the con things uh, confronting the people who, who made decisions, it, nothing is easier than to sit, sit there today and say, oh, th this should have been done, that should have been done. And that's not taking the past as it was. It's, it's treating the past as if it's just the present taking place in earlier times. And that is not the case. When um, Yale University um, took the name John Calhoun off of uh, one of their buildings, what was your reaction? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> By this time, I had given up all hope for the academic world, and so practically nothing surprises me anymore. Uh, if we're, if we're going to, again, look retrospectively, whatever reason his name was put on there, uh, it, it was there, and, and I don't know that anything that has happened since then has made Calhoun any better or any worse than he was uh, when, when that decision was made. If you're going to go back, uh, uh, the first, uh, that you're so desperate for grievances that you have to go back into history to find them, that really uh, 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 says something. We talked about the impact of Vietnam and Watergate on the country. Uh, what about the impact of slavery on the country? Great in, not, in any number of ways. But the question is... Uh, the thing that always gets me is that the past, whatever it is, good, bad, or terrible, it's irrevocable. And the only thing we have any influence over are, 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 the, are the present and the future. And nothing that we do, I, I, I was so pained to, 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 to learn that apparently Angela Merkel in Germany felt a need to take in these refugees in order to help Germany live down on the terrible record of, of Hitler. Nothing is ever going to change what Hitler did. Nothing. All you can do is do things that are going to have an effect in the present and the future. And the effects that her policies are having in the present have been disastrous. And there's no reason to believe that they're going to be any less disastrous in the future. I want to go, <clears throat> excuse me, go back and look at some video of you in 1987 testifying before the United States Senate Judiciary Committee about Robert Bork. It's is about 30 seconds. This may be the most important Supreme Court nomination of our time, not simply because the present court is so closely divided, or even because Judge Bork is the most highly qualified nominee of this generation but because this is an historic crossroads as regards the expanding power of judges, which is to say the erosion of people's rights to govern themselves democratically. Why did you testify there and what impact did the rejection of Robert Bork have on the rest of the judiciary over the years? Oh, my, I testify because of the gross distortions that were coming out. Uh, I would listen. I was listening to the he congressional hearings during the day, and I'd hear how Bork uh, was, you know, at the very least, racially insensitive, or, or, or actually opposed to civil rights and so forth. And then I would go over to the Stanford L Law Library and and and, t and, ch and check out Judge Bork's uh, record and his record before he became a judge. And I discovered uh, in, in those files uh, Amicus Curiae. Uh, 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 Papers filed by Judge Bork repeatedly on the side of black civil rights organization. I learned that no civil rights advocate had ever lost a case in Judge Bork's court. Uh, and I was already familiar with, with uh, Bork's record uh, before, he even, uh, before I even looked into the law because I was teaching economics. And I often uh, read things that he wrote about antitrust law, which were, which were brilliant things. And so an enorm enormously intelligent man, an enormously decent man, and all sorts of utter filth was brought up. Uh, one being, for example, that he, had, that he worked 
for big corporations, you see, because money was more important to him. And Bork was, a, was an academic, which is not a big, a big bucks uh, enterprise to get, get rich quick, uh, uh, and a government official, of which the same could be said. And for, at the particular time he went to work at a high salary in business, his wife was dying of cancer, and he wanted to have the money to make her last days as comfortable as he possibly could. And for that to be turned into, into, into some kind of cheap political charge was just truly despicable. More than, more than that, the difference of one man on a Supreme Court that's divided is enormous. And every time I read a, an opinion by uh, Judge Anthony, Justice Anthony Kennedy that is wishy-washy and, and, and uh, incoherent in some cases, uh, I think that that's the price of defeating Judge Bork. So, because he was sent in to replace him. What else? Uh, do you, what, do you, what do you? What is your take on the Supreme Court today, just as an institution after <clears throat> all these years? Oh, it's very dicey. And when what's dicey are, are the freedoms that depend upon whether the courts enforce the Constitution or whether they go off on their own social adventures. Uh, I, I think the greatest uh, disappointment with this court. Uh, was uh, just Chief Justice Roberts disregarding the Tenth Amendment and finding some terribly clever way of evading it and declaring Obamacare constitutional. You know, the Tenth Amendment says that the government has only such powers that are specific, the federal government has only such powers as are specifically designated to it, and all other powers either belong to state governments or belong to the people themselves. There is no power for the federal government to tell people what kind of medical insurance they have to buy, even if they prefer something else. But because I have no idea what terribly clever reasons uh, judge, the Chief Justice might have had, but well, once, once you knock down the, the 10th Amendment, there's really nothing the government can't uh, order us to do. Here's another clip of, uh, we talked out in Palo Alto in 2005, and it's very brief, it's only 20 seconds, and I want you to give us uh, your reaction to what you said then. What's yes. the impact of 9-11 on this country and the world? Oh my gosh, we will never be the same again. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed in people who seem not to realize that it's not business as usual anymore that it's really, a, there are things we have to do that we don't want to do, but the alternative is far worse. That was actually 2005, and uh, here we are 12 years later. What would you say today if the same question was asked? I think I'd give the same answer, and I'd be more apprehensive today because the previous administration has now given Iran the go-ahead to develop nuclear, nuclear weapons and Iran is testing intercontinental uh, missile, missiles. Now, the thing that they, they, are, they're, they're, they're supposed to be uh, preparing to do is attack Israel. Israel is closer to Iran than Boston is to Denver, all right? You don't need intercontinental missiles to attack Israel. You need intercontinental missiles to attack people who are, across, who are in another continent. And uh, it's, it's not a great mystery as to who would likely be the target of it if, if they ever decided to go that route. And, and I think right now we're doing what was done by the Western powers in the 1930s as Hitler was building up his war machine. You're, you're going from day to day and you're trying, you're taking the easy path and the, avoiding the hard problems on the, on the assumption that somehow or other you'll muddle through. And uh, they came very close to not muddling through. France, of course, was conquered uh, during World War II. Uh, sometime, uh, in one of my columns recently, it may have been one of the uh, last ones for all I know, uh, I suggested that people who want to understand what is happening in the world today should read a book called The Gathering Storm, which, has, which is not, not about today. It's about the 1930s. But once you see this kind of feckless drifting in the face of fatal dangers, you understand what, what, what kind of thinking is going on, or lack of thinking uh, is going on today in the way that we're approaching the kinds of dangers we're facing now, which are far worse. Uh, most people don't understand that for the first three years of World War II, 
the Western powers never won a single battle, literally, either in Europe or in Asia. They were beaten time and time again because the pacifists had gotten their way in the 1930s and prevented an adequate buildup of military forces for which men paid their lives in, the, in those early years of World War II. Fortunately, at some point, uh, the West learned, learned their lesson. The United States entered and with tremendous uh, productive capacity uh, was able to supply itself, Britain and the Soviet Union with the power of the weapons needed to, to defeat the Nazis and later the Japanese. You, uh, but we're not going to have that kind of time in a nuclear war. You're not going to have three years to muddle around and get beaten and then come back. Uh, we, we'll be lucky if we have a year to get beaten and still come back. The, the gathering storm, as you said, in that late column in, in uh, December was written by Winston Churchill. Is there anybody today, in your opinion, besides what you just said, that is suggesting that we ought to worry about the gathering storm in, in public life? Oh, there are people who, 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 who oh, you mean uh, holding some official position? Yeah, I mean, are there people not that, that you I respect? Not that I've noticed. I mean, you, you don't get, you don't get um, two Winston Churchill in one sentence, in one, one century. Ronald Reagan would be the uh, uh, closest analogy, but of course he too is gone. The, again, uh, we, we never seem to look at what are, what are the inherent constraints within which you're operating and what can you do uh, within those constraints. I think of Reagan, you know, when the Soviets built, set up, started building up uh, nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe, pointing at Western Europe, and Reagan responded by sending in uh, American nuclear weapons in Western Europe, pointing in Eastern Europe. People were horrified and said, this man's going to get us into a war. Uh, we'll be annihilated. And uh, he, fortunately, he disregarded them completely. And in, instead of getting us into a war, he brought the Cold War to an end. People who lived through the Cold War with the fear of nuclear annihilation hanging over, over us all that time have no idea what a feat that was. And he did it without firing a single shot at the Soviet Union. Uh, but, but, that, that, but, you know, he, he was never, I don't think he was ever considered for a peace prize. You know, you don't get a Nobel Peace Prize for having produced peace. You get a Nobel Peace Prize for saying the kinds of things that people who are on the Nobel Committee think are going to going to going to promote peace, uh, even though those things, such as the policies of Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain in the 1930s, said, uh, uh, which led to war. Since you've been retired from writing your column, um, how closely have you paid attention to what's going on in in this country and the world? Oh, not nearly as closely as before. None of it is truly encouraging, however. Well, I, I won't say that. Uh, I think the, the new administration in Washington uh, has some very good people, better than I think most recent administrations have had in, in the top positions. The only question is whether the, the president listens to them. And that we won't we won't know until you know a lot more time has passed. I, I want to change. I want to completely change what we're talking about to something <clears throat> that you seem to enjoy and it's important to you. As you mentioned, uh, when you took your four days off and went to Yosemite with your friends and did your photography, how long have you been a photographer? Because you have this on your website, and we're going to show some in a moment. But how long have you been uh, doing photography? I took my first picture in 1950. Uh, and, I, and then when the results came back from the, to the drugstore, I was just hooked from that point on. Previously, I, I had been thinking of becoming an, an artist. I used to do a lot of sketching and so forth. And so I had a sense of, uh, you know, uh, design and, you know, art and so on. Uh, and then when I was uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, the, the Marines sent me to the uh, Navy's photography school at Pensacola Naval Air Station. And then there, there I got a, a, a you know a professional training in, in in the subject, and then when I got out uh, and I was going to uh, went, went away to Harvard, uh, uh, I I worked for the uh, university news office as a photographer in order to help pay the bills, and so uh, it, it was the, it was the perfect job because it was something I could do whenever I had the time, uh, not 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 just the taking of pictures. But when the photographer in charge, he always had more negatives than he had time to print them. And so if I happened to be awake 
at 2 a.m. for some reason and wasn't going back to sleep. I could go over to the uh, news office, uh, let myself in and, and uh, print all, all the negatives that he had sitting there on his desk and leave it on the desk for him and tell, tell him my time so I'd be paid. So it was just, it was, it was a great job. Well, for, for the audience, I can see you. You can't see me. Uh, and you're not going to be able to see these pictures, uh, I, photographs. Uh, but I want to throw one up on the screen. I know you've got a list of what we're going to look at. The first one, I think, is Yosemite. It's, uh, uh, is that El Capitan? That's El Capitan. Uh, it was taken with a 4x5 Linhoff camera and probably a 75 millimeter wide angle lens. When did you take that? That I don't remember, but it was uh, it was uh, before I became, went digital, so it was probably it was probably uh, towards the end of the 1900s. And the next photo is a waterfall. Do you, re yes. do you remember that from the oh, list? Oh, I think I, I think it's I, th I think it's Yellowstone, uh, Lower Yellowstone Falls, in Yellowstone National Park. What you, it, this is, it appears to be, it's black and white, and how much? Oh, it, black and white. Then it, then it was not Yellowstone. Yellowstone was in uh, the. Oh, oh, I know. Heavens, that that would be Yosemite Falls, in and, the winter, I believe, because I, I think there's snow on the ground. And how much of what you, your photography is black and white and color? Uh huh. Do you like do you like black and white or color when you're uh, uh, doing your photography? I, I like I like both, but but uh, when I when I was doing film, I, I most of it was black and white, and now that I'm digital, most of it's color. A color film can be very delicate, uh, and so when I travel with color film, I had to take along a, a cooler that I could plug into the car to keep it cool while I was traveling, and then I'd have to plug it into a hotel room or outlet when I got there because the colors will change if you let let those let the color film sit out in the warm weather. But fortunately, with uh, digital, it doesn't make any difference. The third uh, photo is a young lady sitting on a chair. She yes, looks like yes. she's about three or four years old. Uh, who, do we know who that is? Uh, I know, but I, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention her name. <laughs> uh, but uh, she, she is now uh, a retired lady. When did you take this picture? Oh, oh, back in the 1950s. I believe, in fact, I'm almost certain it was before I... No, I know it. It, it. it was probably after I went into the Marine Corps, because I, I know it was taken. I know what camera I took it with. Uh, it was a Bush Pressman, and a, I know the lens and so on. So it was that would have, that would have been in the early, still in the early 1950s. Is there any way of, of uh, calculating how much you have? I mean, I don't need to know the dollar amount, but have you spent a lot of money, a lot of your your uh, uh, extra money that you have on photography over the years, and has it been an expensive hobby? It's, been, it's, it's really my only extravagance. Uh, I, I, I'm not big on clothes or other luxury. My wife doesn't wear jewelry and stuff, so uh, this, is, this, this is the only, on, only thing. I will say that when I finally uh, uh, decided to go completely digital and sold all my photographic equipment to a local camera store, uh, they paid me over $10,000 for what was at that time uh, used, used equipment, some of it obsolete. So I must have spent an awful lot more than that when I bought it originally. Here's a f photograph of uh, kids playing on the beach in the water. Oh, yes. Where's that? That's, uh, that's, an, that's the Santa Monica Beach in Southern California. The camera was a, a twin lens reflex called a uh, Mamiya 330. And, and I was probably I was probably on the, the boardwalk, the Santa Monica boardwalk, looking down at them, and I saw the picture and just took it. What What have you done with all your photographs? Have you cataloged them all, and you're going to give them to somebody? Uh, no. Well, uh, I have I have I have negatives. I have a few. I have a few uh, that that are that are prints. Of course, most of them. I, well, the ones that I really like, I have hanging on the walls in my in my home. So, but uh, I, I have the neg the negatives a tremendous n number. My first negative in my file was taken in 1948 of people uh, picketing the White House when Truman was president. And over the years, how many different kinds of cameras have you used? Oh my gosh. At one time, I had a dozen cameras simultaneously, 
So this will give you, and, and, and there's obviously been a turnover. Today I, I struggle along with just six. What kind of cameras? Now uh, I do most of my my uh, picture with pictures with two, two Nikon D three Xs, uh, and then I have uh, a, a couple of Sony uh, cameras and, uh, and a couple of others miscellaneous. Here's a photograph. But, uh, I, Here's a photograph of a gentleman uh, painting with a beret on and a cigar in his mouth. Where is that? Oh, yes. That's Greenwich Village, 1952. And the camera was a, a roller cord. What, when you take a picture of somebody uh, like this, do you have to get their permission to use it? I hope not because I didn't get his permission. <laughs> here's here's a, a, an aerial shot of it looks like Niagara Falls and my first it question is. is how did you get this picture? From a helicopter. Now as sometimes I've uh, chartered a helicopter for this, just for this purpose but in this case they happen to be an already existing helicopter service and so I just got on it for the heck of it and uh, he flew around Niagara Falls and I simply shot the picture out the window. Have you sold any of your photographs? Not really. I've, I've, uh, some of them have been published. Uh, there was a picture I took of, uh, of a lady who was an academic, and, and someone did a, uh, some kind of feature about her, and uh, they requested uh, a co copy of uh, this photograph. I'd given it to the lady in question, and when they were interviewing her, they asked if they could use it, and so I uh, said, sure, go ahead. Uh, I put one on, on the cover of a book of mine, uh, Fortunately, unfortunately, that book was uh, out of print inside of a year, and so it got very little exposure. Want to show a photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge and cars coming across it? And again, the same question: From what angle? How did you get this photograph? Well, there's, there's an observation area near the Golden Gate Bridge, and I had a uh, my Nikon D3Xs, and I and I have a 200 to 500 millimeter telephoto. And I use that to take that, pic that, that particular picture. What are you looking for when you do photo photography? I'm looking for something that makes an interesting uh, 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 scene. And when I see it, I, I simply go take it. Uh, one, one, sometimes I pre-plan. Uh, and looking through old uh, uh, pictures of, of uh, Yellowstone National Park, before I ever went there, I saw a picture of the lower Yellowstone Fall, and I thought, my gosh, I'm sure, they, I'm sure I could take that picture better than that. And when I went there, uh, I, I, I set it up, and I think I did take a better picture than that. Uh, my wife tells me that I was there for two hours. Uh, fortunately, she brought, brought along a large book to read, as she does on these occasions. Uh, but uh, I was amazed when she told me I'd been there two hours because it, it, it I took the, the picture from every conceivable uh, position with every conceivable camera and lens combination. How long have you been married and where did you meet your wife? I've been married 36 years and uh, I like to say that I got my wife because of affirmative action. That uh, I had written, I'd written an article about affirmative action uh, uh, which she read in, in Palo Alto, and she complained to a, 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 a mutual friend that uh, she really objected to what I had said and thought I was wrong. He said, well, you know, he's right here in Palo Alto. Uh, why don't the two of you get together for lunch and work out your differences? Well, we got together for lunch. We have not worked out our differences uh, <laughs> uh, to this day, but uh, things took, uh, took a turn in other directions. Does uh, she agree with you politically at all? Uh, on, on a lot of things, but of course, no, no wives and husbands agree on all things. What would be your advice after all these years of marriage where you married somebody that didn't have the exact political views? How do you deal with it? Oh, heavens, I, I'm not one of those people that thinks that you go, you go berserk because someone dares to think differently than you do. Uh, my heavens, uh, no. <laughs> That, that, that doesn't make it. It's, it's, it's pathetic that people nowadays think that the fact that they disagree with somebody is a reason to go uh, uh, creating a riot and destroying pro uh, property as at Berkeley just recently, uh, latest among any number of similar incidents across the country. 
We have one last photograph, and that is an aerial view that you took of Stanford University, right where you are now. Um, from what angle, where were you when you took this picture? I was in a helicopter that I chartered. And we simply flew over the flew over the campus, and uh, took, took, took took the pictures. And uh, um, not, after all, obviously the, a, a handheld camera. That tower that we that tower we see is the Hoover Institution, or I uh, yes, it is. Now, yes. you've been there how long? Uh, since 1980, which would be, oh my heavens, 30. My gosh. It's about 36, 36 years, plus. Yeah, 37 years. <clears throat> but how, is, how has Stanford changed um, since you've been on that campus? You know, I, I am one of the least informed persons uh, you could have found on what goes on in the Stanford campus. I took the job at the Hoover Institution rather than another job that was offered to me back east, uh, mainly because by this time I was thoroughly uh, disgusted with the academic world. I, was, I, I never planned to teach again. And uh, the Hoover Institution was the perfect place for me because it would allow me a place where I could do the work that I w wanted to do in re research and writing and so on and have absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the campus. And that's been my policy the entire time I've been here. Um, and I, uh, it's been the happiest and most productive part of my uh, career. There is something, I wondered if you were aware of this, something <clears throat> um, on a... Uh, on Twitter called at Thomas Soul that y you did not start. Are you aware of that? The uh, Someone Twitter told site? me that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't think I've ever gone to, to, to look at it. It, it. He says, if it's a he, he says, I'm not Thomas Soul, but I own all of his books and tweet quotes from them. <clears throat> and I'm going to read back to you the, a couple of the quotes that he has tweeted out to uh, the followers. He's got some, over 87,000 followers reading your work. Here's one that just says, most people who read the Communist Manifesto probably have no idea that it was written by a couple of young men who had never worked a day in their lives and who nevertheless spoke boldly in the name of the workers. Similar offspring of inherited wealth have repeatedly provided the leadership of radical movements with similar pretenses of speaking for the people. Was that your book on Marx? Oh, I... I don't, no, I would. It would no, no, I, I, I don't think I would have put things like that in that particular book, which was really a study of the history of ideas. Were you ever a Marxist? Oh yes, during my twenties. Uh, fortunately, unlike today's uh, uh, left, I never felt uh, that I had to avoid seeing what people with different views thought. And so uh, during all my years as a Marxist, I read everything across the political spectrum. I have to this day a book on Burke that I very first read back uh, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, uh, on, and, and I treasured that book. I could tell even then. And so uh, I understood that there, there were reasons why people have different views, as I see even today. That it's not just that uh, it's, it's the uh, it's not just just a question of being on the side of the angels against the, the forces of evil. Here's another tweet, and it's your, these are your words: "Racism is not dead, but it is on life support, kept alive by politicians, race hustlers, and people who get a sense of superiority by denouncing others as racist." Yes, I I suspect that there are millions of Americans who would be uh, gratified if the whole subject of race simply vanished into thin air because they're sick of hearing about it. But there are people for whom this is a very lucrative business. Uh, I'm amazed at how little attention was paid to the fact that uh, Al Sharpton uh, owes the federal government millions of dollars in taxes. You don't owe millions of dollars in taxes unless you've made millions of dollars in income. And the question is, how did this man, uh, you know, ever get into a position to make millions of dollars other than by race hustling? One more tweet. You will never understand bureaucracies until you understand that for bureaucrats, procedure is everything and outcomes are nothing. If you have been living in a world where outcomes are everything, you may have a very hard time understanding bureaucratic thinking or practices. Yes, yes. I know from time to time my wife is amazed at some of the foolish things that are done uh, by the government. 
But if you understand bureaucracy, it makes perfect sense that, uh, I'll give, give you an example. Some years ago, I went on a trip uh, in which uh, I, was, I turned my uh, uh, expenses over to the university for a reimbursement. And uh, no one at the, uh, the university questioned any of, any, of, any of the major expenditures, but someone decided that uh, I should not be reimbursed for the collision damage uh, 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 cost of renting a car from one of the agencies. Uh, because Stanford has this clause that it, it covers that and so on. And I was so outraged that, I, that I, I went to the head of the Hoover Institution, and he had better things to do than this. And so he gave me a, 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 a mid-year raise in the amount of the collision damage waiver <laughs> 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 so that, so that the, he, he could get this thing all, all, all off his back. But those people who did that never asked, you know, why did I, why was I there four days for this event? And the answer was I had a lot of other research. But I said, there's no need to even say that. So long as they have paper, they're happy, you know. Uh, and, and, and so they, they seize upon these little things that are utterly inconsequential uh, and they let everything else go by. You're not that far away from your 87th birthday. What do you intend to do with the, and this sounds like a crazy question, for the rest of your life, what do you want to accomplish? What's your so-called bucket list for the rest of your life? Oh, I'll be happy if I can f finish up all the things that I have currently going, which will be quite a, quite a, pro quite a project. Uh, right now, I've, uh, I've already finished uh, up uh, the third edition of... Uh, my book, Wealth, Poverty, and Politics. L months ago, and my assistants are so busy that they haven't had a chance to, 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 to work on that and to, and to put it into print. So you got a, a, a book, book coming out soon? Not soon. Uh, and, and, and I don't even have a timetable because uh, I find the easiest way for me to work is to tell no one, not even my agent, that I, that I, what I'm working on. And when it's all finished, uh, I then send the finished manuscript to my agent and then leave, leave it with her. And she knows to call me back when she has an offer. Our guest for the last hour has been Dr. Thomas Sowell. He's sitting uh, on the Stanford campus uh, where he has an office, but he writes a lot out of his home. And um, there's a lot to read if people are interested in reading a lot of your works or your books. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. If you enjoyed this week's Q&A interview with Thomas Sowell, here are some other programs you might like. Our 2005 interview with Mr. Sowell on politics, his books, and his views as a conservative African American. George Mason University economics professor Walter Williams talking about his life and libertarian views. And conservative radio talk show host Mark Levin discussing his career, his books, and politics. You can watch these anytime or search our entire video library at cspan.org.